Coming up, after 14 years of corruption, incompetence, austerity, taxation and small state dogma, there are so many factors that have resulted in the death rattle of the Tory party. Many of those factors will be endlessly debated by the media and put forward as reasons for the party's demise. But during this lengthy campaign, you're far more likely to hear the words prorogation, disintermediation or nativism than you are to hear the word Brexit. Brexit is the subject that dare not speak its name, with general agreement among the Tories and Labour that no one will even mention it during the election campaign. But it's Brexit which guaranteed the demise of the Tory party. Stay tuned. Before we get into it, please give this video a like and share to your social media. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. And my sincere appreciation to these recent Super Thanks contributors. Your support is truly appreciated. So, the Tory party has existed in one form or another continuously for three and a half centuries now, since not long after the English Civil War. And love them or hate them, and I personally hate them, to be quite frank, the party has shown amazing adaptability over the years. It accommodated itself to the enormous increase in the electorate after the Reform Acts and Representation of the People Acts of the late 19th and early 20th centuries and became a genuinely popular party even after voting rights were extended to the non-property classes and women under 30. In my opinion, the Conservative Party represents only the interests of the very wealthiest in our society who have the means through the media and other sources of influence to convince a sizeable proportion of the electorate to vote against their own genuine interests. Perhaps not quite the false consciousness of the Marxists, but certainly a lack of awareness, a lack of interest in politics and a lack of education. For example, I find it very illuminating to look at the vote by educational level at the last general election, where voters educated to degree level or above were literally half as likely to vote Tory as those who left full-time education at age 16. And unsurprisingly, the same rough educational breakdown also applied in the disastrous Brexit referendum, where those with a degree or higher qualification were more than twice as likely to vote Remain as those with no qualifications. And that's not the only sense in which the increasingly unpopular Tory party and the increasingly unpopular Brexit are linked. Let me explain what I mean, but please bear with me if I hark back to Tony Blair. Sure, I know many of us on the left shout war criminal as a reflex whenever we hear the name Tony Blair. And it's also true that Blair's government to a large extent accepted the economic inheritance of Thatcher. But on the other hand, there was the national minimum wage policy that Blair brought in, the low pay commission, the tripling of NHS spending, thousands more teachers, doctors and nurses, the incredibly successful Sure Start scheme to support youngsters and the doubling of per capita spending on pupils in state schools. I could go on, but my point is none of these policies would have been enacted by a Tory administration. There were far greater differences between Blair's government and the outgoing major Tory administration than there is between Starmer's Labour and Sunak's Tories. So, if there's only a cigarette paper between Sunak's Tories and Starmer's business-friendly Labour Party, the daft Rwanda policy aside, why do the Conservative Party find themselves in such an existential crisis? Despite Liz Truss, Andrea Jenkins and Nadine Dorries saying otherwise, I don't think the Tories can really blame it on Sunak. The real cause of the Tory party's demise goes under the guise of the sack of custard otherwise known as Boris Johnson. Johnson never supported leaving the European Union. According to his own sister, Rachel Johnson, he thought Brexit was either a shit idea or a really shit idea. You see, it has divided the family, but mainly into members who think that Brexit is a shit idea and those who think it's a really shit idea. <laughs> Boris Johnson backed leave in the referendum in 2016 only because he'd figured out that it was the only way he could become leader of the Conservative Party. So one of the most consequential changes in our recent history, which is Brexit, was largely the work of one cynical opportunist who didn't believe in it in the first place. For 50 years leading up to the Johnson Premiership, the Tories had a tradition of being much more of a Europhile party than Labour were. 
It was in fact the Labour Party which was badly split when Tory Premier Edward Heath took the country into what was then the common market in 1973. Labour Prime Minister Harold Wilson had to hold the 1975 referendum when he got back into office to patch over the issue within the Labour Party. In the Parliament selected in 2010, 2015 and 2017, there was a majority of both Labour and Tory MPs who wished to remain in the European Union, and the discord with the results of the referendum affected the Tories much more than Labour, simply because the Tories were the ones in power. The shock of Brexit fundamentally changed the nature of the Conservative Party. Pro-EU Tory Prime Minister Theresa May called a second election in 2017, hoping to increase her majority because the government response to the advisory referendum had led to an impasse. The result was that she lost her majority, with Labour performing better than expectations under Jeremy Corbyn, either because voters liked his manifesto or because they had a deluded belief that Corbyn was more likely to deliver a second referendum on Brexit. The ridiculous referendum called by May's predecessor David Cameron was a textbook demonstration of the incompatibility of rule by referendum and a parliamentary government. Because before and after that 2017 general election, we ended up with a House of Commons obliged to put through a measure that most MPs didn't believe in, which was the beginning of the Tory death spiral. May failed to achieve majority support for her Brexit and was overthrown by Johnson, who then won the 2019 election with a large majority. But the circumstances were unique. Voters were simply exhausted by the parliamentary impasse and the phrase Get Brexit done, did the rest. Boris Johnson ruthlessly annihilated some of the better people in the Conservative Party who refused to swear allegiance to the Brexit project. People such as Dominic Grieve, Rory Stewart, Amber Rudd and several others. With a vastly depleted stock of talent, with only the Brexit swivel-eyed worshipping dregs remaining, the Tory governments of first Johnson and then Truss were soon exposed as completely useless. Rishi Sunak is merely a Brexit-committed symptom of the Tories' crisis. He's not even who the party wanted. They preferred the bonkers far-right libertarian Tufton Street puppet Liz Truss, who had the zeal of the convert on Brexit, and we all saw what happened then. But whether it's under Johnson, Truss or Sunak, the Tories' handling of Brexit negotiations and the damaging consequences of Brexit in the real world have impacted voter trust. Many voters feel that the Conservative Party didn't deliver the Brexit they thought they were voting for, while other poor souls can't bring themselves to face the fact that this is indeed the Brexit they voted for, preferring to believe that Brexit hasn't happened yet and that humans have never landed on the moon and that the earth is flat. So there is a widespread sense of betrayal among both pro-EU and pro-Brexit Tory supporters. Back in the real world, the post-Brexit UK has faced trade disruptions and increased bureaucracy alongside the massive hit to the economy, reckoned by Goldman Sachs recently to be around 5% of GDP, which is even higher than the 4% impact forecast by the government's own Office for Budget Responsibility. The Conservative government's aggressive stance towards the EU has made the impact of Brexit even worse than it needed to be. And that's been a big factor in the shredding of their reputation as the party of economic competence. Brexit has also led to a reshuffling of traditional voting patterns. The Tories will lose their hold over the Red Wall now that Brexit has changed from unicorns in the sunlit uplands crapping out rainbows to a complete shitshow in the real world. And they're losing more moderate and younger voters too, particularly the more educated and voters in more affluent and urban areas as well, who are generally more pro-European. The Tory party has survived for three and a half centuries because of its capacity to adapt and shapeshift. But Brexit has frozen their ability to change, and their rigor mortis over Brexit has guaranteed their annihilation at the general election. Their next big shapeshift is unlikely to be a softening on Brexit. 
Far more likely, it'll be the idea that Nigel Farage could be the great saviour of the party. Garage, not garage. And Farage, not Farage. Let's strip away his small-minded man pretentiousness, shall we? If the Tory party wasn't already dead, the idea that the racist rabble-rouser Farage could become their leader and somehow breathe life back into their lifeless corpse is as grotesque as it is laughable. He'd be more like a wooden stake through the heart of the vampiric Tory party. And at that point, those few remaining moderate Tories still clinging to the cadaver would flee. There's no one at this point that could save the Conservative Party however often they're invited to appear as a guest on BBC's Question Time. It was Boris Johnson's Brexit that did for the Tory party.